Good evening. <clears throat> I hope some people will be joining me soon. This is Tea with the Druid. Here's the tea, here's the Druid. So this is what it's about tonight. It's about ritual. I was really interested in what Philip said about ritual and I understand completely his urge for simplicity, to simplicity. I think a lot of people who've spent many years doing ritual feel this. And I really wished I'd been in the room with him because I thought, I don't just want to listen and just type. I want to have an actual discussion. Now there's a long um, pedigree of Celtic formal discussions. They are called colloquy. Colloquy, and there's a famous one called the Colloquy of the Two Sages. Um, and really, I suppose in the way that uh, poets or rap artists might um, have a public uh, spectacle of showing their talents, I'm quite sure that the bards, ancient bards did as well. And this was called the Colloquy. So more on that in a moment. Let's see who's joined us. Oh, Tim and Jan. Jan from Poland. Jan, we've had our first frost here. I don't know what the weather's like in Poland. And Paul. So I really wanted to have a discussion with Philip. I wanted to have a colloquy about ritual. I thought, well, actually, we still can. Because... Um, being druids and being adept at time traveling what we're having if i respond to what philip said in his ritual is we're just having a time traveling colloquy it's as if he has um instead of taking it in turns turn and turn about he's presented all his facts and then he said and now what are your opinions on colloquy ms billington or on uh, ritual ms billington and I'm going to use the time-honoured phrase for colloquy and say, not hard to answer, which is how the, the ancient bards always responded to a challenge to take up the um, theme. Um, I'm very interested in ritual because with my uh, druid oppo, Matt McCabe, I help run the uh, OBOD <clears throat> workshops. Um, which are called Inner Journeying and Ritual uh, Workshops. And they're designed to support the course. And one of the main things that people say when they come is, I just don't get ritual. I just don't feel comfortable with it. I don't feel happy. I don't understand what I'm trying to be doing. Um, and I actually did a, sponta uh, a spontaneous ritual. This is the second reason I'm interested at the moment. In September, I did a spontaneous ritual with a group of people who happened to be marooned in a marquee because of a sudden downpour. And we did a magical ritual, um, which worked amazingly. Um, and so I've written a book about that. It's just come out this week. Um, and it's, the book is called How to Stop the Rain, Magical Conversations with the Cosmos. And the thing I noticed after the ritual, which took 10 minutes and was brilliant, was that afterwards, no one mentioned it. No one spoke about it. It was as if we were all a bit embarrassed and shy about it. And that's how people feel about ritual, I think. Um, when I back, went back to Philip's ritual tea with the Druid, I started reading all I stopped listening to Philip and started reading all your comments, will you? which were absolutely fascinating. A lot of people just don't seem to get ritual at all. Um, and you made some very interesting comments. The main comment that came out, of course, is that we don't have one sort of spiritual practice. We don't just have one thing or another. And of course, there are times to sit by yourself or to walk by yourself and make your walking into a moving meditation or a ritual act. And then of course, there are times to push the boat out, put on your, um, your druid robe and uh, 
take up your wand and brandish it around. Uh, why? Because we put in all the hard work as druids. Why shouldn't we have the fun as well? Um, but of course, we don't do ritual because it's fun, although it might be. We'll go into the reasons why we do it a bit later. Hello. For some reason, that uh, connection was lost. I, I'm so sorry uh, for anyone who's been uh, discombobulated by it. I'm hoping that you've logged into this new connection and that we can continue talking about ritual. So if you would kindly let me know that that's happened, that would be wonderful. Otherwise, I'll just keep speaking and we'll say that um, I hope you'll be able to comment later. Yep, okay. Julie's saying hi again, and so is Babette. Thank you very much. Tamsin, thank you, people. You're very reassuring. Okay, so there is a time for simplicity, and there is a time for more elaborate ritual, of course. And as Ben put on his comments, what we're making, whichever we do, is we're making a special time and a space beyond the norm. And I think that's the important thing. Because whether we want simplicity or whether we want more elaboration is just completely subjective. It might be to do with the personality and how we respond to things. It's like, say, it's uh, to insist that everyone takes, their set, takes the same spiritual path and the same way to get to that time and space beyond the norm is as foolish as to try and tell people what paintings we should like or what music we should like um, or to deny us any personal choice really. Um, there might be aspects of the personality, some people are naturally more mystical, by which I mean being in the world, naturally wishing to be in the world. Others are more magical, by which I mean more uh, wishing to do in the world. Of course, magic is uh, mystical and mysticism is magical. So there's a fair overlap there. The main thing is that when we do ritual, we are actively, consciously making an effort to engage with the mysterious. We're acknowledging to ourself, ourselves that there is an invisible energy in the world that informs what happens in our lives. There are things that are greater than us that we cannot perceive with the world through the world of the five senses. And by firstly acknowledging that and then finally to make a structure to hold us while we try and visit that place um, we are consciously joining in with the universe and the invisible forces that are behind it. So even people who say I like spontaneous ritual, I like simplicity, if you look you'll find you've probably got a structure, a really simple structure that says oh yes but I always do this, I always get my walking boots, I always get my stick, I always, when I walk through that gate, I always take three breaths with the trees. You might find you do certain things that allow your mind to just gradually focus down and down until you get to a place that is not way up in the sky, but is actually the connection with the universe deep inside ourselves so that we can feel that the reality of the spirituality of life. So that's as far as I've got with that. There's a, but there's something else to say. Let's see what you've got to say first. Hello, back in. Yep, that's lovely. All of you are joining in. Um, the thing about ritual is that when we're trying to um, uh, contact the mysterious and the invisible, Bells and smells often help us. If you think about it, bells, music, singing, 
chanting. These are all vibrational, aren't they? They're all vibrational notes in the universe that I think can tune the brain in to this different way of perceiving the world just for a short space of time. And um, this is why my husband Arthur and I really love the pre-enlightenment composers because they were composing with the idea that they were contributing, um, creating something that somehow brought them in tune with the music of the spheres. In some way, their music was connected to the spiritual aspect of the universe. And of course, certain smells, they say that sense is the last thing to go. It's a very primitive sense. And we all know that the, the smell of a certain perfume or, or of a cup of licorice tea can take us back and back and back. So of course, if we always use frankincense or sage or something for our rituals, just lighting that, the act of lighting it, reinforced by the smell, is enough to help us go deeper into the place we're meant to go to. I must rush on because, of course, uh, well, I just have a lot of ideas and um, I'm trying to express them in a short space of time. So the question is, when we do ritual, before we know whether it works or not for us, what are we trying to do? And what we're trying to do, I think, is make an interface, make a place between the worlds. Now, it could be a place between the world of waking and sleep. There's that lovely little interface there, just as you drift off, just as you wake up, where it's quite good to observe what happens there. Um, we could make uh, rituals at uh, an interface time to reinforce the fact that we are trying to make a space between spirit and matter and bring the two together like a like a Venn diagram like a, the chalice well symbol we've got a circle invisible world world of the five senses and we have this overlap at ritual this space in which we can work with the two completely in our bodies enjoying and celebrating being human using the breath using movement using chanting using singing and yet using it to contact the invisible and every time we do that we are reclaiming something that has been neglected a part of ourselves that is essential i think for our health um now lots of you made the point that um with spontaneity versus formality, you sort of have gone through the formality of ritual into spontaneity and simpler rituals. So I want to ask you this question. Just think about it. Does, because Philip mentioned that, oh, you're introduced to 12 or 13 rituals in your first year in OBOD and encouraged to try them out and to experiment for yourself. So my question is, does our formal practice <clears throat> allow our later spontaneous practice to move more easily. And I think there's no question, no question that it does. Um, it make, I believe it makes us feel more at home at, at entering a special space, a time beyond time. I think the formal practice is in, of inestimable worth in doing this. And its enemy is embarrassment and self-consciousness. And that is what turns it into andram, which is the opposite of what we want. The idea of being in ritual is that you are so focused on being in that space of the meeting of spirit and matter that actually whatever you say, whatever you do, will be the right thing if your focus is, uh, is set up right. Um, and of course, there is that thing of steady practice and the effect it has. John Michael Greer is a Druid uh, author in America and he's fabulous. He's a very accomplished author. I'd recommend anything of his, John Michael Greer. So listen to this, it's a bit of a quote from him. Every movement in space persists forever 
if you move the point of a pen an inch across a sheet of paper, that movement sets space in motion and the motion never goes away. In the normal way of things, such a motion quickly gets absorbed in some larger pattern of movement, but the cosmos is never quite the same as if the movement hadn't happened. And the same is true of every action, every thought, every word, and I think every ritual. Every movement lays down what, uh, uh, what is called a track in space. Now that, I think, is one of the things that our formal rituals do. And one of the things I don't think Philip mentioned is why we might use a script with ritual is that the people who wrote it were writing a magical template. They were writing a template for people to use it to move into a space to make the trackway to that space easier and easier for those who come after. And those trackways have been walked now for over 50 years, which is quite a thought, isn't it? People we will never know and never see and who died, you know, in the early days of the order were doing similar things to us. Um, yes, uh, we all know this in a personal sense, says John Michael Greer. Repeat the same action over and over again. It becomes a habit, reinforce the habit, it becomes fixed. Um, and then he tells us this really interesting experiment. <clears throat> Rupert Sheldrake ran experiments that demonstrated this effect, that if other people have done things, it's easier to do them. He showed, for example, that English school children who didn't know a word of Japanese were able to learn a Japanese children's song faster than they learned a sequence of nonsense syllables set to the same tune. Now, the Japanese, of course, were nonsense, uh, Japanese syllables were nonsense syllables to the English children, but they learned them fast, faster. So the question is why? Why? Because generations of Japanese children learning that song laid down tracks in space that the English school children could still follow half a world away. If we believe in invisible forces and forms, influencing us, then this is not difficult to understand and it's something that occultists have known for many, many years. Um, so thank you John Michael Greer. Apart from that, what our robot uh, rituals do or any church ritual or service does is it bonds people. It means that people can uh, meet from all over the world and feel comfortable and at home. And the lovely thing that the um, Obod ritual does as well is it sets out our ethos at the beginning of every ceremony. Um, the first, uh, uh, when it set it out, it does the next important thing, which is it asks for pe it petitions for peace, which uh, cannot be done too often before we do anything for ourselves with petition for peace but we, before we do that we set out our story as druids and we say uh, by the power of star and stone by the power of the land within and without by all that is fair and free we welcome you to this ritual whatever the ritual should be now what wonderful words to start with not you come to a, a magical thing, you've come to a spooky thing, oh, come and be scared at our mighty power, but you are welcome by all that is fair and free. That's the Druid ethos, I think, and I think it's worth doing formal ritual just to repeat that eight times a year. Um, <clears throat> so we've got to, uh, time is wasting, time is moving on, and we're going to Philip invited you to do a micro ritual, a uh, micro retreat. We're going to do a little micro ritual, five minutes within a moment. Let's just go back to what you said last time. Ritual, says Ellie, is something that links us to something important in ourselves. Rosemary says, 
it must be authentic and sincere. Our daily life is our sacred practice, bringing spirit into action. Says it all, really. And Cheryl says, both are perfect, spontaneity and simplicity and formal ritual, whatever works for the individual. Sometimes working with others fulfills a need, sometimes a simple breath or walking in nature. It is all ritual if one is focused on their awareness of it. So if you'd like to, just for five minutes, let's focus our awareness on being able to go into an inner space together. I have my ritual candle here. Light a candle for spirit. This is the earth candle for the green night as we go head towards solstice there sound therapy yeah there are some interesting comments i'm going to read after for now let us take a ritual three breaths together one with the earth beneath us and one with the sky above us. And one with the seas all and rivers all around us. And as we feel the blessings of earth, sea and sky, let us begin to sink into an inner state and let us reinforce that by stretching our arms physically above our heads. As if we're doing a tiny bit of Phillips tree meditation and open them out. And as we open our arms out, it's as if we're opening our awareness out. So that we can walk gently and quietly into a grove of trees, a grove of trees, most of them losing their leaves, the golden few spears of the birch still hanging, the gold of the hazels making a carpet on the ground, the red russet of the beeches, the dull brown of the oaks. You choose whichever trees are in your grove. And feel if you're in the northern hemisphere, the slight tinge of ice at your nostrils as the cold evening settles down and see the first quarter of the moon high above you in the sky. And those in the southern hemisphere see the mysteries of your sky with your different stars and the different aspects. Maybe the eucalyptus trees, I know that there are tree oms that have been made in New Zealand and Australia. Find yourself in a grove of trees. And let us just say once again, the herald's welcome. By the power of star and stone, by the power of the land within and without, by all that is fair and free, we are welcome in this grove. This magical night. And as we slowly turn around in the grove, in the centre of the grove, we put out our hand, 
point our finger as if it's a wand and slowly move round spinning on our own axis slowly delineating the circle at the circumference and as we do it imagine that circle being a circle of peace and light and we declare may there be peace within and without in the north, south, west and east, above and below. May there be peace throughout the whole world. And our circle is made. There is nothing we need to do in this circle. Simply be aware, be aware of being in a place where matter and spirit can meet. Where our bodies breathe an air that is invisible, but essential for life. And with that breath, they breathe in the essence of the trees, of the leaf matter, of the life of the forest. We don't have to do anything but accept and allow that this is a good thing for every level of our being. And if we wish, we can slowly turn again. And we see the glimmer of a silver birch tree or a light tree and we know we're looking at the east. And we know if we wish to, we could call upon the powers of the east. Represented by the hawk of dawn soaring in the clear, pure air. And just knowing we could do that is enough as we turn to the south and are aware that the energy of the south, the revitalizing energy, is always there. We breathe it in as we remember its totem animal, the stag in the heat of the chase. And we turn to the west, perhaps a watery place, low-lying or boggy. And we think of the salmon of wisdom deep in the pool and of the water in our body, the lymph glands, the excretory systems, the water that pours through us and cleanses and revives us. And finally, we turn to the north. The bear in the starry heavens and the deep and fruitful earth our home for as long as we're alive. And we feel the rocks, the solidity of the trunks of the trees. And we remember, remember that little chant, earth my body, water my blood, air my breath and fire my spirit. As within, so without as the greater, so the lesser, as above, so below. And our job is to connect the heights and the depths, the circumference, and simply to witness, witness the beauty of this earth that we're privileged to live on.
and we make a ritual petition. May our lives on earth be blessed and we, may we pass those blessings on to make this world in every way a better place than if we'd never lived. That petition goes winging its way out, and as it does, it feels as if the tinkling energy is fragmenting the grove of the trees. You can feel something has happened, and it is done, and it is time to return. For now is the hour of recall, as you see the circle you've made fade like mist in a morning meadow. The scene disappears like a watercolour that's had water splashed on it. And you feel the need to move back and wriggle and stretch. Move your shoulders, stretch your arms up above your heads again and come back to the fabulousness that is you on this earth, in front of your computer, now. And that was what I call a mini ritual. Oh my goodness me. It's time I finished, isn't it? Let's just have a quick look. Ah. Oh, Ruth, 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 that's wonderful. Are all ceremonies ritual, but not all ritual ceremony and so on? That is definitely a question for another night. I must let you get off. It's, um, it's not fair keeping you too long. I just want to say I'm really looking forward to all the comments that you've made and I'll try to respond uh, to them within the next couple of days. Thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to chat about things I love again and uh, blessings to all. Have a great evening and um, I'll read these very soon. Good night. Yeah.